And with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Bronislav, St uh, sorry, Borislav Stanimirov. And he has been a professional CC programmer and a game programmer too. He has worked at Masthead Studios on Earthrise, in Gameloft, and in several startups, and that includes Chobolabs on Mayhem. His interests include low-level programming, optimization, programming languages, and software architecture and design. Today, he will be talking about a CPU-friendly code. Let's have a big hand for Borislav Stanimirov. <laughs> Borislav says he's a Ruby programmer trapped in a C++ career. Let's see how it <laughs> checks out. Uh, CPU friendly code, oh notation, isn't everything. Okay, we're not gonna do that. So, um, hi, um, I'm Borislav. I'm mostly a C++ programmer, I do other languages too. I'm mostly a game programmer, but I also do other stuff. And I also do open source, you can find me on GitHub over here. Follow me, start my projects, make me famous. So today we're going to talk about optimizations and as, a, as, as an intro, I have some quotes I want to share with you. Anyone know who that is? Anyone? Yeah, that's Donald Knuth, one of the most influential authors in software engineering and uh, programming. He authored the book, The Art of Computer Programming, which is probably the most influential book for algorithms and uh, software patterns. So he said, optimization is the root of all evil. Now, probably most of you know that this, this is not the correct quote. The correct quote is, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And I have no problem with that. I do have a problem with the previous one. And the previous one is sadly very popular, and some people are opposed to optimization as a matter of principle. But premature optimization is the root of all evil. The thing about this is that this can be misleading because some people think that Premature equals early, and I will put forth that early doesn't necessarily mean premature. premature. So, but some of you may also know that this too isn't the entire quote. The entire quote is, we should forget about small efficiencies, say about 97% of the time. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. And sadly, this talk is going to be about the 3% where we shouldn't forget uh, about those small efficiencies. We're going to talk about things that we can do early, we can do as we write the code, so basically at the earliest possible moment. Anyone who know who that is? Yeah, that's right. That's Andrei Alexandrescu, who wrote Modern C++ Design, who basically single-handedly gave us Modern C++. So his quote is, to some extent, optimization is to our industry what sexual intercourse is to teenagers. There's a veil of awesomeness surrounding it. Everybody thinks it's cool, has an op opinion about it, and talks about it a great deal. Yet, in spite of ample folklore, few get to do it meaningly, meaningfully or at all. <laughs> so in the spirit of this quote, we won't do anything meaningful, we'll talk about a lot of stuff, but we'll talk about like fundamental principles and not about like concrete algorithms that you can actually put to use at this very mom moment. We'll talk about ideas and fundamentals. So nothing meaningful at all. Anyone know who that is? Oh, of course you don't, that's a friend of mine. Uh, he works at uh, Chaos Group, uh, he works on Ray tracers, the V-Ray ray tracer. Anyone heard of the V-Ray ray tracer? It's it's a popular thing in I know in art circles and in movie makers. So actually, it's used in a lot of Hollywood movies. But when he heard the title of my talk, he was like, "Well, it's 2018. Who writes for the CPU? Come on!" And by that he means the GPU. So there's this thing called GP GPU, or it nowadays it's mainly used for heterogeneous programming where you harvest the power of your video processing unit or graphics processing unit, the GPU, in order to, to perform general purpose calculations instead of playing games, for example. And even though he was joking, that's probably a valid question. Why am I talking about the CPU and not the GPU? 
Well, the GPU is like crazy mega powerful with, with Tailwind and, and a Swift kicking a butt. The CPU can probably process about 20 gigabytes per second in I know, ideal conditions. Whereas a GPU can process an order of magnitude more, so 200 or probably 300 gigabytes per second. Gigabytes per second. Like, come on, think about that. But that's in an ideal world with ideal conditions. So for some problems, that this could be achieved. For others, sadly, it cannot. There are many architectural differences between a CPU and a GPU, but you can think of them like this. The CPU is composed of a few powerful, very complex cores. A GPU is complex, composed of um, hundreds, even thousands of small, very simple cores. Um, one of the main differences between those is the more complex cores of the CPU can handle like swi context switches, uh, branches in the code, and everything like this much more gracefully. Whereas every time you try, try to halt a GPU, you pay a tremendous price. For example, if you put a barrier in, in a GPU core, like that's synchronization primitive, many other cores will stop doing anything until that barrier is reached. So you, you need a certain kind of algorithm which is appropriate for a GPU. So, and the GPU is inappropriate for cases where we have, for example, a little amount of data. So to, send to, to, to actually make the GPU process our data, we need to send it over the PCI bus and get it back, the, the, the actual results. So if you have a small amount of data, it's highly impractical to use the GPU for it. Also, there are algorithms which are non-parallelizable, so where the each consecutive calculation depends in some way on the previous one. And sometimes our GPU is very busy as it is already, so we want to actually make use of the CPU too. So if, we, if we're using 100% of our GPU, we wouldn't want our CPU to be idle, right? So still, a lot of the things I'm going to say in the talk also apply to GPUs, but we will focus on the CPU. And um, a popular way of approaching uh, problems with the performance these days is to add more hardware. Hey boss, the website is slow, add more hardware. Hey boss, I need a vacation, add more hardware. Um, every problem these days, especially in web development, and I'm talking to you PHP guys, uh, is solved through adding more hardware. But even in your computers, modern problems are solved like this because we've reached the limit of clock speeds, like five gigahertz is about the best we can get. So currently in order to have a more powerful CPU, you need to add more cores to it. So add more hardware, more CPUs, more CPUs, more cores. So we won't be talking about this. We will focus on a single CPU, on low-level concepts, which are true for every single one of those CPUs, but our talk won't cover anything in terms of parallelism and multithreading, much as it doesn't cover anything about GPUs. We will talk about hardware, at least a bit. And now, the subtitle of the talk is O notation isn't everything. Do you know what big O notation means? Who knows about it? Okay, a lot of hands. So, briefly, it's an asymptotic evaluation of the complexity of an algorithm. That's a mouthful, so um, we'll try something simpler. But that you should know that there exist uh, theta notation and big omega notations, which are very similar, so we won't be covering those. Uh, and even in many cases, what people mean when they say big O notation is actually big theta notation. Anyway. So um, basically, the O big O notation evaluates the growth of the complexity based on the growth of the input. So it's a function which basically tells us how our complexity function is affected by the size of the input. There are also literal little O and little omega notations, and we won't be talking about those. Though th they are either too conservative or, <laughs> from depending on your point of view too optimistic, probably. So uh, I have found little use of them in, I don't know, when we're talking about software. 
so um, the thing is that there is this ephemeral thing we can call real complexity. Now, real complexity is, is something that I won't define, but I'll try to, to give you an idea of what I mean when I say real complexity. It's, it's hard and, as you'll see, probably impossible to actually define. So let's have an example where we have a, like some algorithm with uh, a, the, a big O notation complexity of O1, so a constant algorithm. So let's get the sixth element from a container. And if you have a container which is uh, in contiguous memory, we can just, with random access, we can just access it. We get it. That's real complexity one, in a way. But what if you have a linked list? We don't have random access over linked lists, so we need, we need to iterate over it six times in order to get the, the result. Now, this is still O1, it's still constant complexity, but the real complexity is actually something like six. We need to do six steps in order to get to the actual value. Some more. You probably get what I'm saying, but let's say you want to sum all the elements in, a, in, a, in some kind of a container or list. Now, for a vector, for example, we can do this. Uh, for a vector of integers, we can do this. And the theoretical real complexity should be about n. That seems right. But what if you have a vector of three-dimensional vectors, of three-dimensional points? we need to do three additions for each iteration of the loop. So the theoretical real complexity of this should be about 3n. So what I want to say with this is that um, we need to have some idea that something like real complexity actually exists. So we also want to, to having this knowledge about real and uh, actual asymptotic complexity, we can use some hacks when, when, we, when we talk about our algorithms. For example, if we have constant complexity and everyone wants to have constant complexity, that's what we strive for, it would be the best. But what if it's the constant is 1,000? That means that if you have a way of achieving the same result in with, uh, with a linear algorithm, which is uh, for, for less than 1,000 elements, it will be faster. If you have a quadratic algorithm for less than 32 elements, it will be faster. If we have a cubic algorithm for less than 10 elements, it will be faster in terms of the magical real complexity that I, that I was talking about. Again, if we have a linear algorithm with 100n, where the constant in the linear algorithm is 100, any quadratic algorithm with less than 100 elements will be faster. Cubic for less than 10 elements will be faster too. So, and so on and so on. It's useful to have an idea that real complexity exists and uh, perhaps we can make some changes in our code based on the size of the input given this. So uh, now let's try to have a demo. Hopefully everything works out. So in this here piece of code, is anyone here not familiar with C++? Okay, so I don't explain that, wouldn't explain that much. So basically what we have here is a vector. We fill it with random elements, then we do random two-dimensional points, and then we create, uh, we calculate the Manhattan length for each point in a simple loop. And here we have a linked list, and we do the same. So when we run this demo, can everyone see this? So uh, what we see here is basically that list is always slower, even though it's exactly the same operation. A loop which finds the Manhattan length of points within a list or a vector. And not only that, the bigger the input, the slower the list gets. Well, that's, that's strange, isn't it? Now let's see another demo. What we have here is um, a vector to which we add elements. The, to the back. So, and you've heard, if you add elements to the back of a vector, it will grow and uh, the old elements will be copied. So if you want to add a lot of elements, use linked lists. So, okay, here we have an example where we have a linked list and we add elements to the tail of the linked list. So what if we run this demo? What? The list is always slower. Not only that. The bigger the input, the slower the list. Well, so what I mean with this 
is that modern hardware and the here we have an example of real complexity versus uh, theoretical complexity, theoretical O notation complexity. Adding elements to the back of the vector should be a, at the first glance, uh, n square, a quadratic algorithm. But suddenly it's faster than the con constant, a linear algorithm, but suddenly it's, it's faster than the constant one, presumably, which is adding elements to a list. So uh, that's because modern hardware helps us actually achieve better results through our code without actually affecting the, the correctness and execution of, of what we've written. And that thing basically makes, sadly, well, unfortunately, thinking about real complexity, well, very hard and actually evaluating the real complexity nearly impossible. But nevertheless, we'll try to, to cover some elements of hardware design which work underneath the hood of our computers, which actually govern the world of real complexity in the software we're writing. And the first one is, of course, cache locality. And I'm not talking about bundles of money. I'm talking about cache, as in the French cache, which means a hidden spot or hidden place or something like this. Anyone here speak French? Okay, no one speaks French, nobody speaks this language, it's crazy. Um, I'm certain that those people don't exist. So let's have a situation in our CPU. So the, the CPU tells the memory, give me four bytes at this address, guy, and then the memory responds, sure boss, you got it. And in this world, the CPU is obviously the boss of the computer. What happens when this gets, when, when after this situation? We, w w uh, what happens actually is that caches g get involved, but the, do you know what caches are on the CPU? Who, who knows what caches are on the CPU? Oh, a lot of hands, so I'll, I'll be very brief here. So cache is basically memory which is close to the CPU and cache is split in levels. Basically, the, the smaller the number of the level, the closer it is to the CPU. So this is an example. Uh, this is a four-core CPU. I forget which actual model it is, but that doesn't matter. You see the L1 caches, they, they are the smallest ones, but they are the closest to the core. So basically, uh, electricity needs to cover a very small distance in order to get from the cache to the CPU. You have your L2 caches, which are, again, per core, bigger and a bit farther away. And the L3 cache, which is a lot bigger, but it's shared between all cores. You can think of, for example, L0 cache as being inside the CPU. So it, it's not to say cache in this uh, regard, but you can think that L0 is in the CPU, L1 is the closest one, and then, and so on and so forth. Now, in certain cases, some motherboards, at least in the I don't know, not so distant past used to offer like an additional layer of cache, the L4 cache, which was not part of the CPU, but close to the CPU, still on the motherboard, that doesn't matter. You might sometimes hear of uh, L4 caches. So uh, responding to the order of the CPU, the memory bus will basically do, uh, the, the memory bus will uh, provide the memory to the CPU and the CPU will uh, trans transfer it like this. So uh, approximately four kilobytes surrounding the required uh, address will go to L3. 256 bytes, and these numbers vary amongst different CPUs, but they're more or less in that uh, order of magnitude. So approximately 256 bytes will go to the L2 cache, and approximately 64 bytes will go to the L1. So these are uh, piece of memory which surround the actual address. The, it might be at the beginning or at the end, it depends on I know, alignment of the address within those uh, like ideal pages, if you want. Those are not what people call actually memory pages, but you can think of them as pieces of memory which are consequentially add, uh, added to, to the CPU. So, if the data that the CPU requests is in the one of the caches, we call this a cache hit, and if it's not, we call it a cache miss. So how much does it cost? So if you have to go to, to L1 to get data, that's approximately four cycles. So cycles are basically the 
the, the ticks of the CPU, so the cycles of the CPU, a 5 gigahertz CPU will make 5 billion ticks or 5 billion cycles per second. <coughs> so, um, approximately four cycles, again this differs for different CPUs, but that's a good estimate go to in order to retrieve memory for L1 cache, approximately 10 cycles for L2, approximately 20 cycles for L3, so not that big of a difference, but approximately 100 cycles, or in some cases 200 or more, in order to retrieve an address from the RAM, from, from the actual memory of the machine. So a cache miss is something that we don't want. It is very expensive. It's much more expensive than going to even L3 cache. So what does this mean, basically? This means that if we retrieve memory and then process the entirety of it from the CPU, uh, from the memory uh, at the CPU, we will have a lot of cache hits. Like if we process consecutive memory, we will have a lot of cache hits and we will rarely have to wait for the memory to respond and give us more. So what is fast? Processing arrays of value types or plain old data. Like when the value of the object is stored in contiguous memory. Any type of pr contiguous memory processing is basically the fastest thing we can do with the CPU. This is the tailwind and the kick in the butt I was telling you before. So in an ideal world, the CPU will only process contiguous memory and everything will be awesome. And what is slow then? Indirections. So indirections are basically pointers. Uh, if we have to, to get the data from a pointer, this is an indirection and this leads to potential cache misses. And this includes dynamic polymorphism because dynamic polymorphism is basically pointers to functions. So we need to retrieve the address where we want to, to go to, to make the next execution and this could potentially be a cache miss. So that's why people who say that dynamic polymorphism is slow, object-oriented programming is slow, that's what they mean basically you have to rely on function pointers and potentially have cache misses. So, as you might hear if you're in the parallel talk, but you're probably not, uh, there's this thing called data-oriented design. Basically, this deals with the problem, like at the very, very, very basic level of array of struct versus struct of arrays. Anyone heard of, heard of this? So, yeah, if, if, we, if we have uh, an array of structs, like our struct can have a uh, position and uh, an age, for example. Uh, I don't know why I chose those fields. But uh, one of our subsystems cares about positions and the other cares about ages. If we have an array of those structs, uh, one of our subsystem, for example, the one that cares about ages, will have to skip through each position and potentially make more cache misses. But if we have um, a struct of arrays, so a struct of array of positions and array of ages, both systems which care about one or the other will process the data in the most friendly, CPU-friendly way. So this is, these are design approaches in order to make our software more cache-friendly. And there is this ancient Bulgarian proverb, less cache misses lead to a happier CPU. And I do have a lot of these truisms for the future. Now let's have more demos. Of course, we want to look at more code. So demo three is, okay. Uh, in demo three, we have a vector, we fill it with data, and then we find elements in the vector by, uh, with linear search. So we fill it the vector with random elements and then use linear search to find some elements in it. And in the other example, we use a std map. It most of you probably know, but studmap is a red-black tree, so it's a binary search tree, so every search in a studmap is binary. But the thing is that the vector is contiguous memory, so all the data in the vector is in a single memory block, whereas the map, being a tree, has all the elements in potentially different places in memory. So, luckily for us, uh, library authors have done a lot in order to improve this, but still, if we run demo three, it takes a while, sorry. For a very small input, like 20 elements and probably about 30, the vector is still faster. Even though we do linear searches in the vector and uh, binary searches in the map, for a tiny amount of elements, the vector is a better choice. 
So in some cases, you have a small amount of data, and in that case, doing linear is actually more uh, optimal than doing logarithmic because you will have less cache misses. And I have an even better, I don't know, approach here, and this is the flat map. So a flat map is basically a map which uses a vector as an underlying storage. So if I, oops, I forgot to save. So if I run the test like this with a flat map, which basically is the best of bo both worlds, you can see that it's much faster than any of those in every regard because you have less cache misses because of the continuous storage and also you have binary searches uh, within the elements. Uh, also, let's check out demo one again. So what did we have in demo one? What can we tell about it? So demo one was the Manhattan land experiment. Manhattan experiment. Mm -hmm. No nuclear bombs here. Don't worry. So um, with the vector, we have contiguous memory. So when we calculate the Manhattan length of the different elements, we gain a lot. We gain less and less cache misses. Whereas in the list, we have elements which are pointers. You know how a linked li list works. So potentially every query for an element of the list could be a, a cache miss. But what if we try to mitigate this? Uh, as you know, the standard library allows us to, to set allocators, and here I've prepared a very silly and uh, don't use the allocator. If you ever come across these demos, the allocator is just for these demos. It's not useless uh, outside of them. So a very silly allocator which pre-allocates a lot of memory and then gives it to the list. So. Um, what if you run demo one again? And you can see, still the list does have to go to, to, another, to other caches in order to retrieve the data, but the list alloc thing is, hmm, especially for more elements, it's much faster than the other. Now, uh, why it isn't for fewer elements, I would probably, uh, uh, that's probably some kind of a, I don't know, CPUs, man, who knows about that? So at the second run, it was faster. So it's much closer to the vector. Still, uh, the elements in the list are not strictly contiguous memory, but I put them in the closest thing possible to contiguous memory for a list. So one block for the pointers and one block for the data. So with the help of L3 caches, uh, a lot of uh, we have a lot less cache misses than we do. Uh, in the other example, where we have everything potentially in different places in the memory. So we did imp get a small improvement of the list thanks to, to, to an allocator. And what types of cache uh, are there? There's data cache, what we basically deal with most of the time. That's the what's, what's in memory, what's, what we use in our program. There's instruction cache, and instruction cache is basically uh, where the which part of our program gets executed. Say if you have a 10 megabyte executable, it can, can be all loaded in, in the CPU. So it loads chunks and chunks of it. And there is uh, such a thing as instruction cache misses, and then that's when we make big jumps in our program. So if we, it's very hard to reproduce because you rarely have control over which part of the program is close to which other part, but actually with linker scripts, you can do something like this. I haven't prepared a demo for this, but if you want, you can play with linker scripts and experiment placing different parts of your binaries closer together and see how that affects cache misses. You also need a bigger binary, like uh, a couple of lines of code wouldn't do. Uh, there's the translation lookaside buffer, which helps you with virtual memory. And anyone here? Are you familiar with virtual memory? That's, a, that's, a, that's fake memory used bar by our operating system, like fa fake addresses, because um, otherwise our programs would be able to read each other's memory if we use the real physical addresses of the, of the RAM. And that's why modern operating systems provide us fake addresses. But in order to get the real, real ones, they have this translation lookaside buffer cache in our CPUs, which helps the CPUs very quickly, with very little penalty, access physical memory through virtual addresses. So uh, all of these differences are in L1, in L2 cache, uh, those are combined in L3 also, and so on and so forth. Also, so that's what I'm going to say about cache, basically. Uh, another thing we have is branch prediction. Do you know what branch prediction is? 
we know what a branch is first. <laughs> a branch in our program is literally like, like a branch. So uh, a part where our code decides to either execute this uh, or, or execute that. So this is a very, very simple example. Say we load the reigning variable, and based on it we take an umbrella or not, and either way we go outside for a walk. But what if we have a cache miss when we load raining? This means that we will have to wait. And if, anything, if there's anything the CPU hates, it's waiting on stuff. So this is a modern out-of-order execution pipeline in the CPU. And just look at the red part. Is it red here? So the pink part, I guess. <coughs> so just look at the pink part. The pink part is basically where the execution happens. So uh, I've illustrated five ports here, but they, they are usually more. So if you have a bunch of operations uh, in our CPU, like an addition, a multiplication, a division, uh, and they deal with data which isn't dependent on one another, they can be executed in parallel. And that's what CPU, CPUs do. Out for the execution means that they grab a bunch of instructions and try to execute independent ones at the same time as fast as possible. So if, if uh, our program has a cache miss and the evaluation of the program depends on the data of the dead cache miss, the CPU will have to idle. And this is a huge investment of power and huge waste of CPU resources if the CPU idles. So waiting is basically very, very expensive in modern CPUs. So, imagine our branch, this part of our code is in, on address, that's address within the executable, whatever, and the CPU observes these results for the branch, like yes, no, no, raining, yes, no, no, yes, 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 yes. So the CPU can make, an, I don't know, a guess that with so many yeses that perhaps the next result will also be a yes. So, uh, for example, in loops, this is very, uh, very, very often occurs, occurs in loops because you have a bunch of yeses and then a single no, like, or a bunch of no's. And are we exiting the loop? No, 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 no. Then oh, okay, yes. So there is a lot of machinery and logic in CPUs dedicated to try to to guess uh, a branch, try to to guess where a branch is going in order to not waste time and execute stuff and not idle while waiting for some data. There is this thing called built-in expect, with which you can influence branch predictors, but that doesn't work on most modern CPUs. Uh, basically, what it, well, it does work in it reorders your code, so the, the more likely branch, in your opinion, will be first. So a cache miss in instruction cache will be less likely, but that's barely noticeable on modern CPUs. Now, uh, earlier CPUs, this actually has an instruction that could tell the CPU, could actually influence the actual branch predictor, but nowadays it just doesn't happen. But anyway, the branch predictor tries to guess where the code is going and execute this part even before having the data. And uh, sometimes the branch predictor has no clue. And in this case, it uh, executes both branches at the same time. And when the uh, data arrives and it's clear which branch is the one to be, to be continued with, the CPU throws away the results from the other and continues with it. So in the worst case, half of uh, the time it will, would have been spent on, on rubbish. And that's called speculative execution. When the CPU executes code which, which isn't clear, it isn't certain that will be the code to be executed. So this is like questionable code. I execute it because I have nothing else to do. I just execute it and hopefully it won't be thrown away. So we have a small demo for here too. So that's demo four. And uh, in this demo, I have a sorted vector, and I loop through the vector, and for each element which is smaller than 0.5, I create some product. Uh, and then I have an unsorted vector, and I do the exact same thing. Each element which is smaller than uh, half, I take the product. So, uh, and those are vectors full of uh, random elements, so about 50-50 of uh, floating point numbers from zero to one. So about 50% of the elements will respond to this condition. The key is that uh, one of the vectors is, is sorted and the, others, the other isn't. So a branch predictor, theoretically, should do this. In the sorted vector, you should quickly 
guess that, okay, this, no, 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 oh, I made a mistake, yes, 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 yes. In the other case, it will try to execute probably, in most of the cases, both of the pieces at the same time, and it wouldn't be that successful. So let's see demo four. And indeed, we have like a fourth times improvement, like four times improvement uh, in the sorted vector compared to the unsorted one. So the sorted vector executes four times more quickly thanks to branch prediction. So branch prediction can actually make a real, real impact. That's not something to, to speak lightly of. And if you're familiar with the current drama surrounding speculative execution vulnerabilities in processors, like the, the simplest solution will be to turn off branch prediction. But since branch prediction is so influential, gives us so much power and so much performance, nobody actually wants to do that. Nobody wants to go to, I don't know, about four times slower execution of the programs. So <laughs> imagine this. <coughs> so um, what can we say about branch prediction? First of all, ifs shouldn't be that scary. Now I've heard uh, bike sharing arguments between programmers. Oh, you can save an if here, or you can remove this check over there. Usually it doesn't actually matter. Uh, in most cases, having an if more or less is not something to be really scared about. There are much scarier parts of your uh, code, uh, for example, potential cache misses. And of course, dense is better than sparse. If you have a, an array of data, which has all the data in a dense chunk of memory, it's better for the branch predictor. Instead of having sparse data, where you the branch when, where if this is true, else, else something else, which uh, often times switches the condition between true or false. So that's, that's sparse data. And anyone know who that is? No, of course, you know, that's Kenneth Clark. And he's the, I don't know, the Carl Sagan of history. So what Carl Sagan does for physics and astrophysics, like movies, books, he, he, he did for history. Uh, but anyway, uh, back when I was creating the, the, the slides for, for the talk, I wanted to find a, a truism like m many of the other truisms. And I was sure that someone certainly said something like, I believe that order is better than chaos. Order is better than chaos. So I searched in Google and found this guy. So order is better than chaos. The thing about truisms is they're true. So even if they sound profound and silly, or silly, uh, they're usually true. So branch prediction teaches us that order is better than chaos. There's something else that we're I want to talk about, and this is syscalls and especially allocations. So first of all, stop. Do you know what a syscall is? A syscall is stop. Stop executing whatever you are executing, leave the premises of your program, and boldly go into the world of the operating system. So what are syscalls? Basically, th those are not library functions, like uh, mathematical functions or the QSort function, which are library functions, are not syscalls. Syscalls go to the operating system and like I can think of a counterexample, but they usually are used to in order to to get or send data to some other device, to, to a device different than our CPU. Like IO, for example. This will send data to the disk or to, to the network, input output, you know what this is. Uh, you know who this is? That's me. And I said another truism. If something, something is slow and it's not obvious what it is, it's most likely I.O. And I advise you to do this. If something is unexpectedly slow, like 99 cases out of 100, the problem with the software is some kind of I.O. Some disk writes or reads, some ne network writes or reads, something like this. This is almost always the, the reason for slowness in the software. But also managing threads, and processes, you go to the operating system. So that's, that's actually not talking to another device, but if you want to, to influence the, the thread uh, scheduler, for example, this will be a syscall because the operating system takes care of this, um, or process scheduler too. <coughs> also, some driver calls, like certainly not every OpenGL call is a syscall, but some of them are. For example, draw calls are usually syscalls. So they go outside of your program and go to the, say, GPU. And of course, allocations and deallocations. Those are the, the most important syscalls because they happen most often. 
practically every program has to have at least some allocations in the allocations. And in those cases, there is an obvious cost. The operating system has to do a lot of stuff, like, for example, synchronize the, the acquiring of physical memory. It cannot afford to give the same physical memory address to two programs, so it has some synchronizations for every allocation and the allocation ever. And um, also, it has to find the free chunk of pages of in the address space of our virtual memory. And also, it has to sync this like between threads and processes. And uh, for this, th th there is actually something very helpful, at least for different programs running on the op same operating system. Do you know what commit size is? So basically, every operating system has commit size. Commit size is when you start your executable, the operating system tries, tries to, to, I don't know, to guesstimate <laughs> how much memory it will need, and it just pre-allocates it and then keeps it, even though the executable is not using that, that memory, it sits there pre-allocated and ready for it, so it can be given away much faster. And operating systems actually analyze different programs and have records, okay, this time this program used like two gigabytes, so next time I'll prepare two gigabytes of commit size and so on and so forth. So commit size is actually very helpful, and because of it, a lot of cases which you would be like abysmally slow because of allocations and the allocations aren't actually that slow in, in reality. But that's not thanks to the hardware, that's thanks to modern operating systems. <laughs> there is also a bit of not so obvious cost, like for example, zeroing and cleaning of memory, because I know you wouldn't want your password from one program which is still in the physical memory to, to come to another program because it's allocated the same physical memory chunk. And also there's the deal with fragmentation. If you allocate a lot of tiny blocks and you allocate some of those, but not ne necessarily ones that are next to each other, you will have, you could have, say, a gigabyte of free memory, but no more than 64K uh, in contiguous memory. So it's a big deal for operating systems and they sometimes have to do memory fragmentation behind the scenes so they can give you the appropriate amount of virtual memory. But more or less every allocation is a syscall. So uh, let's, that's one of the like, instruction cache misses and so forth uh, are the ones that actually govern the slowness of allocations. So demo five. In demo five, we have the basically the same code from uh, demo one with the Manhattan length, but this time we are measuring the adding of elements to the vector in the list. So in here, we add elements to a, to a vector, and here, we add elements to a list, and that's basically it. So as you can see, the list is more or less slower than the vector in each case, because the list makes an allocation each time uh, we add an element, and the vector makes an allocation for uh, like in a logarithmic scale. If you add two elements, it will allocate for four, then if that, is, that limit is breached, it will allocate for eight, and so on and so forth. Thanks to commit size, though, it's not such a vast difference as it could have been, but again, every time, since every time we do have to go to the operating system, so our program breaks, we have an instruction cache miss, the list example is always slower than the vector, even though Ideally, it should be uh, constant, s constant speed, whereas the vector is linear speed, just by allocation. And again, if we, in demo 5, I have the same uh, pre-allocator pre pre available, so I can just enable it. And as you can see, it's a bit faster when we pre-allocate the memory for the list. It basically works much like the vector does, but again, since it allocate bigger, allocates bigger blocks, it's a bit, I don't know, heavier on the allocator side. Because a vector allocates like contiguous memory, whereas the list allocates like structs of two pointers and a, and a data, data segment in the structs. You know what links, link lists are, right? So what can we do in order to 
to mitigate the problems caused by allocations in the allocations. Now, object and memory pools are something that you should learn how to use. Who here uses memory pools, for example? In C++, this is something, yeah, some hands I see, and a lot of hands I don't. Um, and this is why some people will say, oh, well, I made this program in Java, and it's much faster than, it's than when I made it in C++. And there are edge cases and even real world scenarios where a Java or even a JavaScript program will, be, will outperform a naively written C++ program. Because typically virtual machines and um, interpreted languages, they pre-allocate a huge buf buffer for the programs and then they use it for, for storage. Like they use memory pools internally in order to manage your, your, your data. And uh, mscripten is a good example for this. mscripten is uh, a compiler for a C++ compiler which produces JavaScript. So <laughs> you can basically run C++ in your browser without WebAssembly. Uh, it's uh, asm.js. Anyway, so it allocates a huge buffer, and I can give you a lot of examples where uh, a program which is C++ compiled to JavaScript running in your browser is faster than a natively compiled executable because it's pre it pre-allocates its entire heap at the, first, at the start of the program and doesn't actually have to go to the operating system for allocations and the allocations. So pools as a whole are a good idea. Also, reusing objects, which is possible in C++ and harder in other languages, but in C++ it's actually trivial to reuse objects. And of course, we can code it like it's 1969 or 1939, I guess. Um, fixed size arrays. That's another thing that can help us. Also, we, we should learn to use things like vector reserve and basically trying to have an idea of how much memory we're going to need and reducing the number of allocations as much as possible. Uh, and I demo five prime was the list uh, of allocator example. I'm sorry, I made it. So basically, uh, this costs us. Uh, mitigating the number of allocations does have a fixed cost, and it's basically we always have to use more memory than we're actually using. We have to allocate more memory than we're actually using if we want to be conservative and reduce the number of allocations to the most minimal amount. So, um, of course, this will make our code in certain cases like less readable, like wha wha why are you doing this, Where, whereas this here is much easier way to do it. Um, also, there are libraries like malloc-lite, which basically are a, a bit better than, than commit size, because commit size is still managed by the operating system by a library like malloc-lite. It can change the definition of the malloc function you're using, because new also uses malloc internally. That's basically the only way to allocate memory in C++. Anyway, like libraries like this, they do pre-allocate a heap, and then they try to manage and take care of uh, of uh, stuff for you, which the operating system would have cared uh, otherwise. So the, the difference between the operating system management and the malloc -like management is that it's in your program. In your other space, you don't have to go, you don't have to make syscalls for uh, allocations to the allocations because of it. Uh, and of course, those are like extreme cases and luckily, having, I don't know, just a, a small amount of uh, vision towards the future, we can go with 10% uh, of the effort for 90% of the results. Now, there's something else, and those are intrinsics. So, what does a chip CPU do? A CPU basically executes instructions. And um, some of those instructions we can access by writing C or C++ or any other language by simply writing the code. But some of those instructions are quite obscure and not reachable through simple uh, code. For example, uh, RDTSC, so read times time counter or write back invalidate, which is a privileged instruction. Probably some of you haven't even heard of it anyway. So these instructions aren't reachable for our, from, from a typical C++ program. You cannot invoke an instruction in C or C++ unless you use ASM or intrinsics. So most compilers have intrinsics and those are function-like calls. Oh, really? Who is this guy?
Hello. Uh, sorry about that. Go out of the room right now. Um, <coughs> so um, those are function-like pieces of code, which um, they look like functions, but they actually are compiled to actual instructions by the compiler. So uh, in GC and Clang, those functions uh, are the ones that start with built-in, the underscore underscore built-in something, and uh, in MSVC and Visual C, uh, they start with underscore underscore M underscore MMM and whatnot. So uh, there's those two are links. You can, when you check out the slides, you can open it. You can just Google it. It's like the first result in Google. Uh, you can check out the, the available intrinsics in those compilers. And now I have a demo, which can show you this. Uh, demo six is basically, I have this, like this is for MSC, for MS Visual C, uh, and this is for, for GC or Clang. Uh, using the built-in CLZ instruction, which is uh, which compile built CLZ uh, intrinsic, which compiles to the uh, BSR instruction, which is bit scan reverse, and basically it finds the most significant bit in an integer, and with it we can find how many bits we can use in order to successfully store to store a given integer, and basically it can tell us uh, count the significant bits in an integer. So that's, that's the function we have. And then we have the lame approach with a simple loop where we count the bits and basically do the same thing. So uh, then we have a function which uses this in order to count bits in integers, and another which uses this in order to count bits in integers, which uses the intrinsic or the actual, like this basically maps to an instruction in the CPU one to one, and the other is a loop. So what if we were to run this? And as you can see, it's about 23 times faster. So having a single instruction versus a loop is, of course, faster and many, many times faster. That's something to consider, right? So uh, the problems with intrinsics are they're usually compiler-specific, and you have to use different intrinsics at different compilers. They're architecture-specific, because not every CPU supports every possible instruction set. And of course, there's ways to, to mitigate this with different kinds of if devs which check the, the actual architecture and compiler. But it's worth like literally going through them, like reading through the intrinsics in order to, to possibly get some revelations. When I first learned about intrinsics, I just basically read through them all and I was like, oh, if I had known this, I could have used it here and here and here and here. And the revelations are not out of the question when you just read through them. And very briefly, Anyone heard of SIMD, single instruction, multiple data? Yeah, of course, most of you have. Now, this is basically uh, a whole new instruction set, and this is the different types. They are all backwards compatible. Like, nowadays, you can basically assume that every x86 CPU, and, uh, well, every CPU in your computers will have the AVX instruction set. And those are basically ways to execute a single instruction on the CPU operating on multiple data, where instead of adding two integers, for example, uh, it will add like four integers to another four integers or floating point numbers in a single instruction. So for ARM, there are two uh, instruction sets too, like ARM V8. Most mobile phones are ARM V8 nowadays, so you don't even need to worry about Neon or anything. So they are accessed through intrinsics because they are instructions on the CPU. So when you read through the instructions, you will inevitably see like some categories. Through the intrinsics, you will see some categories like uh, SIMD instructions and whatever and whatever. And check those out. They can help you a lot. Mind the alignment. Most of those require a specific alignment for the data they use. So contemporary compilers are powerful. And I could show you a demo, but we don't have a lot of time. So just click this. or make your own experiments, Com compilers, modern compilers, make use of this, and even if you write naive code, it might end up compiled in a great way, in CPU-friendly way. You can check it out, so read your assembly. Now, in this talk, we just scratched the surface. We we're haven't had any deep uh, dives in any of those topics. We were just scratching the surface, and perhaps you're motivated to, to go deeper. And perhaps you already are deeper and you're wondering what is you're yawning and, okay, I know all of this. Come on, guys, shut up already. Um, but to make good use of the hardware, you must know it and read more assembly. 
As I said, the compilers are really powerful, and I encourage you to read more assembly and check what your code is actually doing under the hood. And, but always, always benchmark, as, as you've seen multiple times, it's really hard to, to predict what the CPU will eventually do. And with that, that's nothing. That's nothing, we don't have time for this. But if you ask me, I can tell you. So, thank you. Boris Lassanimirov. I'd like to propose a very quick thought experiment or a mental exercise, if you like. I'd like you to think of a question that you might want to ask Borislav. Just think about it. Don't ask it yet. And I'd like you to answer the question if it's asked. Okay. But the one answer you may not give is add more hardware. <laughs> okay, have you thought of the question? I can figure out some questions where it, this <laughs> is the correct answer, though. <laughs> Okay, I can, I can sense it, it's in people's minds. So, <laughs> so now that you've got the question, yes, thank you, that's the example. So you raise your hand and you ask the question, actually. Uh, hi, great talk. Hi, uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, can you recommend some software to measure the real complexity of the software? Uh, you mentioned uh, Pico benchmark uh, on the slide. Oh yeah, that, that's really simple in multi-platform. I use it because I don't have to make any changes on mobile phones, uh, CPUs, uh, consoles, and whatever. But there are better ones if you have a concrete uh, hardware in mind. Like for example, for eight, six, eight, x86 CPUs, uh, Google Benchmark is pretty great. Uh, Google Benchmark also has some support for ARM CPUs, uh, for Android at least. And um, for consoles, there are different tools. I'm not that much of a console guy, but uh, if you, the best, w uh, the best way to measure the performance of, of a piece of software is to actually count CPU cycles. Mm -hmm. But this is hardware specific. What, what I do in my demos is basically measure time. So I use the best the operating system can offer, but it's not hardware specific and it actually returns just time differences. So PicoBench is, I guess, adequate for when you care about microseconds, but if you delve into the nanosecond world, it probably won't be, w won't be enough for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, look at your hardware. Google Benchmark is something I can wholeheartedly support. Uh, it, it, it's very good at, at working on uh, x86 CPUs and, and also on some ARM CPUs. And one more thing, I was also wondering if there's no, uh, if in case of general purpose tools, like for example profilers uh, in IDEs, there is uh, an observer effect, like when the, yes. the, the code is sampling, it probably won't give you much right, re right. reliable info. That, that's true for, for profilers. There are, there are sampling profilers, there are intrusive profilers, and they all certainly have some kind of a impact on the execution. And that's why, again, they are not adequate for nanosecond measurements. Like usually profilers are adequate for software where you're in the tens or even if not hundreds of microseconds, and that, that's when a profiler would, would actually shine. But the benefit of a profiler is that it understands your code, like sampling profiler and debug information can be combined in order to guess like this function takes this amount of time, this function takes this, like Vtune is a good example for this, but also there are many, many modern ones, many intrusive ones too, like uh, Brofiler was an intrusive profiler, which is quite bro-like. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> but um, Visual Studio offers a great sampling profiler as part of its uh, debugging tools. So yeah, but the thing about profilers is again, microseconds, not nanoseconds. Mm. Thanks. Anyone else, please? Thank you. One over there, and then you'll be next, sir. So thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned that uh, most of the time when programs uh, get slower, it uh, might have to do with IOs. But in some cases, you uh, can't get rid of those IOs because you actually want to input right. or output. So, for example, um, 
Well, who uh, wants input or output? Come on, that's for <laughs> for spoiled um, guys. <laughs> so, uh, running a basic application on a Linux kernel that accesses like um, some kind of a, a PWM driver, um, special function registers via sysfs. Um, you, you lost me at the uh, kernel driver. But uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, so if you've got special special hardware registers on right. your on your chip, like on a ARM A7 or whatever ARM stuff, um, you can you can manage the hardware by writing uh, through fopen uh, to sysfs location right. in order to manipulate your hardware. Yes. Um, on the other hand, you could use the uh, kernel driver libraries, which is quite inconvenient to to get a uh, a handle on because the documentation is, well, not not that good actually. But what other options could you recommend in order to make those uh, those those uh, accesses to the registers at f as fast as possible? Right. While running a Linux kernel. Most of my experience is from way into user land, and you're talking about, I don't know, sometimes, I guess, ring zero stuff. Uh, so what I typically do is much more high level than this. Like, when you identify that I.O. is like input and output is certainly the, the cause, you, you try to, I don't know, use reason in order, in order to fix it. Like, I've never had personal experience with actually getting to the driver or uh, using like kernel driver functions like this because most of my experience has been on mobile devices, on ARM CPUs where, and, and not just any ARM CPUs, but commercial mobile devices where such shenanigans are, uh, well, frowned upon by Steve Jobs himself. So um, you could manage I.O. by getting a deeper understanding of the hardware, for example, sizes of caches, uh, because inevitably every I.O. device, whether it's a network one or a, a disk uh, of sorts or memory, they have some kind of a cache because otherwise it would be even slower to access it. So if you have a better understanding of this, you can manage it by prefetching, by uh, using asynchronous operations and like fake asynchronous operations in order to prefetch something in the cache so when you have to access it, actually it's faster. So there are stuff like this, but again, I'm only talking about user stuff. I'm probably not the best person to ask about driver level uh, operations, and perhaps there are much better ideas there, which I simply don't know. Sorry. For your information, uh, Borislav, three years ago, this very stage was occupied by Andrei Alexandrescu, so it was very nice to have you in the same place, almost the same time. Borislav Stanimirov. Thank you.